Uh, so, I mean, I don't have a timer, but you're going to have about 30 to 60 seconds to answer each one. Okay. Uh, you're putting yourself in the shoes. Well, you're putting yourself semi in the shoes of yourself and semi in the shoes of, of the Economist leader writers. Okay. One shoe each. Four day week. <laughs> Very interesting idea. Um, if you move from six days working to five days working, why can't you move from five to four? Um, I think part of the problem in the advocacy for the four, four day week has been the kind of economic analysis underpinning it, which essentially boils down to we can be just as rich as we are now, but work for 20 percent less. That's I don't think that's true. So you think the politicians would have to make an argument yeah. that you have to accept a lower material yeah. quality of life, which 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 is a which is a totally legitimate decision to make. But I think you have to be honest about that. Okay, you're also going to get thirty seconds to respond to each of these quick fires. Oh, okay, great. Go on. Um, I think sort of neoclassical economics traditionally has an account of utility which is at odds with leisure time. It looks at leisure time as like potentially lost utility where you could have been creating value. So I, I think the sort of the bias built into their models is that a four day week is inferior to a five day week. Okay, AOC's Alexandria ocasio Cortez's 70% marginal tax rate on the highest earners. Uh, the, so this is, this is a kind of more extreme version of what Labour has proposed. Yeah. Which is a 70% marginal version. tax rate on people earning, I don't know what her figure was, over 100 yeah. k dollars or something. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, I, th I would, th the main problem I think is that people think it's going to raise a lot more than it would. This is exactly the same problem with Labour's plans for high rate mm -hmm. taxation. The IFS has been very clear about Labour's plans, which is that it could raise a little bit of money, it's just as likely to raise nothing. I think to build an entire democratic socialist strategy on taxing the rich is not possible. So you think you have and to so have I a think difficult it's, conversation yeah. with it's, the public it's, to say we're going to have to have higher four, levels of tax across the... Yeah, I think so. Uh, Aaron? I partly agree. Um, for instance, like a national care service, ageing is really under-discussed under as a crisis of the 21st century. You will not be able to fund a universal care service with the same principles of the NHS yeah. for an aging population by taxing the top five percent. Yeah. You can for the next in the next Labour manifesto, you can do lots of really great stuff for like twenty billion, right? And it, you know you can maybe just touch the middle class a bit, but in terms of the long term structural transformation, of the economy, climate change, aging, maybe automation. Um, that, that's you know, yeah, I agree. Green New Deal. Should America be spending a few trillion a year? on greening the economy, including uh, a, a reasonable basic income and free healthcare for all? Um, so there's, I have two things to say to that. The first is, there's obviously the question of whether it's fiscally possible. Um, the, as I, as I said to you before we started the recording, the American economy is already running very close to full capacity. A massive fis fiscal expansion like that it's it, you know that's that's a risk right there's a risk of runaway inflation and that kind of thing so i think that's the first thing to say and there's the question of whether you can pay for it there's another argument that the economist has written about which essentially is the is a kind of political economy justification for the green new deal and essentially what it boils down to is in order to affect radical change vis-a-vis -vis the climate what what you can't do this argument goes is rely on the stuff that economists normally talk about so like mm -hmm. ta basically taxation taxation of externality so taxation of pollution the reason why you can't do that is it kind of goes back to the thing we were talking about before which is that that can be undone very easily by lobbyists so the government changes and the, the lobbyists come in and they say that tax you that, that, that you progressive government put on petrol or whatever get rid of that because we don't like it the argument the political economy argument for the green new deal is that what you actually deliberately want to do is to create basically interest groups lobbying groups that are in favor of you not in favor of fossil fuels mm -hmm. so in other words you create loads and loads of jobs in renewables and all that sort of stuff and even if they're not that productive it kind of doesn't matter because what they'll do is they'll have their own lobbyists who will argue very very strongly in washington to keep renewables going to keep renewables going for you know decades and decades and decades and so in the short term you have a bit of a cost because you create all these jobs mm -hmm. that aren't particularly good and it costs loads of money and blah 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 but the long term effect is you save the planet. Now, I don't know if I, I don't know what I think of that argument, but I think it's a very, very interesting argument. And I think it's a compelling argument in favor of the Green New Deal. Yeah, I like that. So, so, so the idea of being that, I mean, what everyone says in terms of policy terms or politics terms is, is that the effects of climate change will be distributed very widely yes. and in the future. And it's very difficult to mobilize people on that basis. Exactly. The benefit of the Green New Deal is it creates 
a bunch of people, potentially millions of people who are structurally incentivized to back green policies in the here and now. So you deliberately create vested interests. Now yeah. that sounds like a bad thing and it normally is a bad thing. Potentially in this case, it's not a bad thing. Aaron, Green New Deal. No, I agree with that. I mean, you have to understand the threat of runaway climate change is very real and it could happen this century. So we can't stop climate warming, but we can certainly limit it to say two degrees. And the worry is if it gets to three degrees, it can go to four degrees and five degrees and six degrees by virtue of des like desertification, methane hydro, all sorts of things. So we do need to act decisively. Uh, and I think the only, the only a agent that can do that is the nation state. Um, so I would agree. And furthermore, uh, renewable technologies are making massive improvements. And I can fully imagine us transitioning to you know, a post-carbon system in 50, 60, 70 years, or for the most part, anyway, you might need 10, 15% nuclear. Um, but that's obviously not quick enough. And so there is an argument to say, well, look, for those experience curves to kick in even more, the, the experience curve is that you, you double the production of something, it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. the cost of production falls. There's an argument to say, well, we want the experience curves. We believe in these market mechanisms to such an extent, well, actually, we need to accelerate them through quite decisive state intervention state procurement. I think that's a good argument for the Green New Deal. Because um, we're at the moment, I think two, three percent of global energy comes from solar, right? And even if it's like doubling every two years, whatever it is, yeah. that's clearly not quick enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the technology's here, but you know, we need to do this in 25 years, which the market, w we have to be honest, the market will not do that. All right, final question. And it was also a cover story of The Economist, but probably not under your brief. Yeah. So uh, no, don't worry about it if, if you don't feel that expert on it. Is Juan Guaido the future of Venezuela? Um, well, I I know that I know that Navarro, certain contributors to Navarro have a, have a have an analysis of Venezuela, which is not what the economists would argue about Venezuela. Um, all I do know is that the Maduro regime seems pretty terrible. The question of whether you should replace him undemocratically is definitely beyond my understanding of geopolitics so I think I'm going to leave it at that Aaron I think my, my views on it are quite, <laughs> yeah. quite well well documented I think it's important to say it's important to say for people in, in, in countries in the global north liberal democracies um, you know we need to have an understanding of what are the limits of impinging on other countries sovereignty clearly there are conditions I mean we can all agree there are conditions where you would want to interfere clearly a, a genocide Right, the Holocaust. We should have, we should have tried to stop. We did try and stop it. You know, we, we tried our best. You know, the Armenian Holocaust. We regret that could have been averted by. You know, that there are clearly legit, legitimizing sort of factors to explain it. Is are those conditions present in Venezuela? I would say they aren't. You know, I would say that Venezuela, even if you, and the people say, with economically mismanaged, it's, it's hyperinflation, all these things, and I might have a di different explanation as to why that's happening to other people. But even if I was wrong, I don't see how their arguments for undermining state sovereignty there's just, a very funny uh, private eye thing that you may have seen last week about this no which is you know basically comparing maduro to theresa may saying like you, you know you're deliberately impoverishing the country no one wants you to stay yeah you're refusing to leave you're in your bunker you don't talk to anyone yeah like i said very funny i recommend it yeah well, it's like, imagine if norway all of a sudden produced this like super weapon and they became like a military hegemon for whatever reason even though they got like six million people and they said, wow, you've misallocated all the funding, all the funds you had from North Sea Oil. You've got 14 million people very low, who are in relative poverty. You've got millions of people using food banks. We're going to replace your government because it doesn't have our values, right? I mean, we would say, well, that's ridiculous. Clearly, that's absurd. And it's, it's I, I look at the sort of the US interfering in Venezuela. I look at the US as a very dysfunctional polity. Um, I, I see that as a kind of actually broadly quite similar, quite analogous. How would you feel about the US like airdropping aid supplies into Venezuela? And ju that just uh, let's say there's no subtext. It's just, just that. How would you feel about that? Well, I mean, they can do what they like. I mean, would you support it? I wouldn't support it. I mean, I, I would say that it's. I would say it's a. It's part of a. I would say it's part of a broader strategy of sort of a color revolution. But they can do it. I mean, it's not violent, is it? Yeah. They can do it. I mean, it's fair play to them in a way. It's like with the BBC exercising soft power through, sorry, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office exercising soft power through the BBC. Every great power does it. Like, what's there's nothing strange about it. Which kind of, it's why I get angry when Brits get angry with like Russia doing it. It's like, mm. Britain's been doing this really well for a really long time. All right, let's end it there. That was a very enjoyable conversation. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Uh, I want us to debate the financial press more often. 